When a man named Adrian died suddenly, his family didn't realize that his face would be donated to Robert Chelsea, the first full face transplant of an African American in history. Here's how Robert feels about it. I see it as a gift. The gift was given by God through his family. They had to make a decision, a final decision, on donating their uh, uh, loved one's face. Hear Robert's story. Then meet Dr. Clive Callender. He's the founder of an organization whose mission is to increase organ and tissue donorship in black and brown communities. 20 people die every single day because of the shortage of donors. And uh, close to 60% of those people who are dying are uh, minorities. I'm Kyone Wolf. That's coming up next on Audacious, right after the news. From Connecticut Public Radio in Hartford, this is Audacious. I'm Kyone Wolf. I want to start this off by saying something like, imagine, after getting hit by a drunk driver, you wake up in the hospital with third-degree burns covering over half your body, including your head. You have no lips, part of your nose is gone, and you're covered in scars. You're a candidate for a full face transplant, which is hard enough to get, but to find one with your darker skin tone is very, very difficult. But something like that, you can't really imagine it. Or if you can, you're only picturing like a couple snowflakes on Everest. Fewer than 50 people in the whole world have gotten full face transplants. And if you're black, you have fewer faces to choose from than any of those other recipients. Way fewer. So today, you're going to hear the story of Robert Chelsea. He's the first African American to get this procedure, and he's the oldest full face recipient in the world. Who does he see when he looks in the mirror? With all the risks of rejection and all the pain from surgery, why did he want to go through with it? And when the doctors first offered him a face with a much lighter skin tone, how did it feel to say no? But first, meet Dr. Clive Callender. He's the founder of MOTEP, which stands for National Minority Organ Tissue Transplant Education Program. Their mission is to educate and encourage more people who are part of the current minority populations in America to become organ and tissue donors. He's also a professor of surgery at Howard University College of Medicine. I told Dr. Callender about Robert Chelsea's story and how hard it was for him to find a face that matched his skin tone well enough. He said that his research points to five reasons why some people in black and brown communities don't sign up to become organ donors. Okay, the first one was the fact that African Americans were unaware of the fact that uh, the, the largest amount of people waiting for organs, number of people who were on dialysis, were there because they were, we had a predisposition to hypertension, diabetes, and because of the fact we had four times the incidence of hypertension and diabetes was the main reason we were needed organs. And they weren't aware of this. They were unaware of the, the, the fact that we needed organs and tissues more than any other ethnic group. The second had to do with religious myths and misperceptions. Concerns that in that great getting up morning, when you go to the pearly gates and to see grandma, grandmama in the hereafter, uh, that uh, you won't have your eyes, you won't be able to see. You won't have your heart. You won't have, have your body parts. And so we... Uh, uh, reminded them that uh, that most religions, including Christianity, uh, believes that in giving that you receive, it's in pardon that you're pardoned, it's in dying that you're born to eternal life. So it is the right and Christian and proper thing to do, to, to give organs uh, in, in life or after death. And so that was the second obstacle. The third had to do with the basic uh, concern over the fact that they may want to use us as goody pigs. Uh, the Tuskegee incident and other uh, incidences uh, forced them to not have trust in the medical community. Uh, so we had to recognize that we had to build up trust. The fourth had to do with the basic fear. That if I sign a Dogen card and I go to the hospital, they might be more interested in getting my organs and tissues than was saving my life. So we had to tell them that we had a system that did not talk about donation until after the person was dead. Uh, and then the final issue uh, had to do with racism. 
uh, concerned that if I'm black and I, you want to take my organs, you want to give them to another white person, not give them to blacks at all. So the, those are the five reasons, the reasons why African Americans were reluctant to become donors. We then uh, postured ourselves to go into the community using the grassroots effort, kind of based upon the civil rights, uh, John Lewis uh, uh, technology that goes into the community, educates and empowers them to become part of the solution to the problem. With this in mind, between 1982 and 1988, uh, the number of African Americans in the metropolitan area of DC doubled, as did the number of people who signed donor cards. Can you talk about where we stand now with numbers, donation numbers with the black and brown community? And what would you like to see? While we make up, African Americans make up 13% of the population and minority population makes up 30% of the population. Now here's a tragic figure. We make up 60% of those people who are waiting for transplants and who are on dialysis. We're now at about 35% of uh, the people who donate are minorities. I'd like us to get up to 40%. That, that's an uh, achievable goal. It's tough to do. Uh, I, I've seen things happen. For example, when we first started, we had eight organ donors per million. We're now at the point where we're at uh, close to 40 organ donors per million. Uh, so it would be wonderful if uh, minority don donations uh, were at the level of 40%, of which would mean that uh, we would shorten the, the waiting list. Here's the problem. We have more than 100,000 people on the tra transplant waiting list. We do only 40,000 transplants a year, which means be short, because of the shortage of donors, that disparity, 20 people die every single day because of the shortage of donors. And uh, close to 60% of those people who are dying are uh, minorities. We have more diseases like hypertension, diabetes, and obesity. And uh, we need organs more than anybody else. So in spite of the fact that we're only 30% of the population, we've got to uh, increase our numbers so that... Uh, we don't have so many people dying every day because of the shortage of donors. What do you think needs to change in order for all that to be accomplished? What more can you do? I think that uh, we have to have more funding to uh, go into the community so that we can get this done. Uh, yeah, we had a great uh, amount of funds early on, but over the last 10 years, that has diminished. So we need more funding. But even more so, I have to recognize that there's likely, we're not likely to be able to do it uh, with aloe transplantation or uh, members of our species. And xeno transplants will, is likely to become something that is in our future as well as stem cell transplantation. What's, what's xeno? Xeno transplant means getting organs from other species like the pig. There was a time when we thought we might want to do the primate model, but after uh, HIV and uh, what we're seeing with uh, COVID, we, we're leery of using the primate model and we're, we're more likely to use the pig model because we have ways of keeping the porcine endogenous retrovirus from actually causing infections. And you'd mentioned stem cells. Stem cells. Oh, yes. Uh, regenerative medicine is the other aspect of this because uh, we now know that we can change some of the skin cells into stem cells that will uh, wind up eventually. For example, if we had the uh, bed cells of the pancreas, it could wipe out diabetes. If we had the myoblast from the heart, the number one killer is heart disease. Uh, so that uh, uh, regenerative medicine and the uh, transplant from animals and other species that are safe uh, could wind up in us uh, accomplishing the goal that we want to have, where we have 100,000 people waiting and 100,000 people who actually receive transplants. In this episode of the show, we're meeting Robert Chelsea. He's the first African-American to get a face transplant, and he's the oldest person in the world to get a face transplant, too. And when he was first offered a donor face, the skin tone was much too light for him, and he said no. Uh, but eventually, a face with a more appropriate shade of brown became available, and that's the face he currently has now. Now, this is not as much of a problem with people with much lighter shades of skin. What are your thoughts about Robert Chelsea's original predicament? 
it's only been about five years that we've had a waiting list for uh, face transplants and for transplants uh, like face and the trachea, et cetera. And so to see that uh, we can have a person of color who can actually get a face transplant is wonderful. This is a miracle uh, that has really come to pass. And to have somebody like that who can uh, go around and, and talk about the fact that a person of color who actually got a face transplant is something that uh, is miraculous indeed. And, uh, and that's who, who can really change things? People who have actually uh, received an organ, received a transplant, whether it's an organ or a face transplant, or uh, I think those are people who can make a difference. And, and because there's a lot of distrust, people like him can erase that distrust. And so we need more people like, like him to be able to, to get around and to tell their stories so that people can understand that that we need it more than anybody else. Therefore, we need to become part of the solution to the problem. We developed MOTEP with the idea of going to the minority community because that's who we, uh, we need to go to. But that doesn't mean that the majority community should not be part of the process because most of the donors are, are a majority. So that we need everyone to be part of the process of all ethnicities uh, and uh, organs uh, can be used regardless of ethnicity. And there are groups that, uh, for example, the Asians have the best success rate and African-Americans have the least successful grade, uh, success organ transplant survival rate. But that doesn't mean that uh, uh, all groups shouldn't participate in, in donating. You've been working on this for 30 plus years. What do you think you would say to yourself if you could travel back in time and give yourself a message at the very beginning of all of this, what would you say? It's possible. The dream is possible. And when I started, I thought it was an impossible dream. Uh, but that didn't stop me because my life has been associated with impossible dreams all my life anyway. Uh, I guess I've never learned uh, uh, to uh, give up. But I would tell them, hey, you can do it. You can do it. Uh, nobody told me that when I started, though. No. They told me the opposite. It's impossible. Uh, but that's what I'd say to Clive Callender 30 years ago. Yeah. And actually, when we first started in 1978, when they came and told me that uh, they didn't have any funds for us to, to help solve this problem, I'd say, hey, get into it. You can do it. <laughs> well, I've asked everything I planned on, Dr. Callender. Is there anything that I missed or anything else that you want to make sure you say? We need to recognize that uh, we're, we're going into the future. And in the future, stem cell transplantation, transplantation with organs from other species is going to be with us. Also, we're going to be able to grow organs. And so that uh, the future, I feel, is bright if we're willing to understand that as we progress, uh, we must always uh, educate and empower the community so that there are no health disparities. Uh, we've learned from COVID uh, that this institutionalized racism is killing us all, uh, and that all members of society uh, can have marginalized members of society because diversity begets ingenuity. And uh, if we have groups that are marginalized, that's the group that will cause the downfall of us all. Uh, so that we must remember that in diversity is our strength. Diversity is our greatest strength. So we should all work together as one and not be divisive, but unifying and working together so that we can all make it together because uh, united we stand, divided we fall. Dr. Clive Callender, thank you so much for talking with me. You're welcome. Thank you for allowing me to be on your program. When we get back, I have new energy, new desire, new uh, life. Meet Robert Chelsea. He's the first African American to receive a full face transplant and the oldest full face transplant recipient in the world. I'm Kyone Wolf. This is Audacious. Stay with me. This is Audacious. I'm Kyone Wolf. 
Today, you're meeting the first African-American to receive a full face transplant, Robert Chelsea. He's also the oldest person in the world to go through this procedure at 68 years old. But let's go back to what set all this in motion. It's 2013, and Robert's on the shoulder of a Los Angeles highway on a hot August day. He'd been on his way home from church when his car overheated. He's sitting in his broken-down car waiting for roadside assistance to arrive when a drunk driver plows into his vehicle so hard and fast that the car he's sitting in explodes. A bystander pulls him out of the car. 60% of his body is covered in third-degree burns, including on his face. After 18 surgeries and four months of coming in and out of consciousness, Robert goes home. But he can't kiss his daughter because he doesn't have any lips. Drinking and eating are difficult, too, and the the tip of his nose is gone, and his face is covered in scars. A full-face transplant, rare as it is, is on the table. He's an organ and tissue donor himself, but now that he's interested in receiving a new face, as we learned in the last segment of the show, finding one that was black enough for him wouldn't be a given. Not by a long shot. It took five years for Robert to get a phone call about an available donor face, but the skin tone was much too light. So he said no. Thanks. My producer, Jessica, joined me on this interview, and you'll also hear from Everick Brown. He's Robert's godson and the executor of his estate. He's also the spokesperson for Donors Dream. That's a nonprofit that raises awareness about organ donation. I asked Robert to take me back to when that first face was offered. What was it like for him to say no? Thanks. Well, it was an easy decision. It was way too light. Uh, There's a range of 18 different ranges of uh, skin tones for African Americans that they have identified. At the time, I I think we only had a choice until my godfather of three skin tones. So that's how bereft the world was of being sensitive to people of color. Right. And if you... If I, as a white woman, reverse that question, like if if I were in a certain situation, yes, like I was gonna yeah, ask if, you, if that I, skin tone is way darker than mine, like it's not a question. <laughs> no. How would you feel? Exactly. But it's interesting because when he made his decision to reject that offer, I called him up and we were on the phone about two and a half hours because my perspective was not about color, which I was very sensitive to you know his need or his desire to have a similar skin color it was really more about how often are we going to get an opportunity to get a donor and so shouldn't we take time to think about this we kind of went through that and i learned a lot i was like okay i get it because a part of it was this happened one time it's going to happen again and this is out of our hands part of the struggle to find the right shade face was because there just weren't a lot to choose from. So I imagine that you hope that more black people, more people of color will feel compelled to, to become donors, right? That's, that is one hope, one individual Raga Chelsea hope. But where my heart is, is for you and, 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 and Jessica and humanity. There is no country, no individual, no location where it's not a great need like this. Yes, it would be nice, you know, I'd not personally like to see a few more Blacks doing this and, and this position and that position. But overall, I mean, how could I, how could I dare to uh, be partial about uh, 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 the needs of the sea of humanity? I think a great deal of hesitation, you know, our percentage is still low overall with all ethnic groups. And part of that challenge could be superstition and religion and and, uh, the trust of the medical industry, which has always been, especially for people of color, always been secondary to whites, obviously. You know, politicians have a tremendous uh, a responsibility also. So it's not just a medical, we can't get the financing and some other uh, 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 internal support infrastructure, if you will, for the medical industry to be able to provide these services 
uh, to other people that may not be as financially influenced. It takes the government, it takes the, your politicians, it takes your, your leaders, all of that. And when they, you can't trust them either, the legal system. You get in, in some kind of trouble, don't, you don't have to get in trouble, just be, just let them look at you. We, we, among blacks, I could say to Ricky right now, I said, you know, that police officer gave me the look. Well, he knows exactly what that means. See? Well, what do you mean the look? <laughs> I don't have to ask. I know. And I know what that means. So we, we talk a lot about, oh, yeah, well, the hesitation is because we have no trust. In, but it's all around. The government, the politicians, they have no, no confidence or no support. Look at the schools. Our schools are much more run down and not what? There's a lot of distrust in a lot of areas which does not motivate an individual to uh, provide donors. And that's why it's always that the most in the white group, I think it's around 30%, 30, 35% at the most. So what about the other? Uh, uh, 65%. What a system like some other countries have of opt out, you know, like in the United States, you have to opt in to be a donor, but there are other countries where the default is you have to opt out if you don't. Is that something that you think would help? Yeah. Well, uh, overall, it's important that we raise, if you will, the level of interest and support and confidence and education. If they only knew one eye could save eight individuals' eyes. Yeah, you just hit it, Chelsea, which is education and communication. A lot of it is we just don't talk about it. So people are not aware, right? They have no idea the significance of what an eye can do for other people. Just have the conversation. It's just like, it's weird as humans, things we talk about and we don't talk about that are really important. Like my mother is holistic and she talks about pooping. And there are people who just, oh, I can't talk about that. But this is about survival of life. And if you want a healthy life, you want to be pretty regular. So you should be able to talk about it in a very fluid way. But people don't. And I think being a donor or donorship is exactly the same. It's one of those topics that's significant that just people are not comfortable talking about because we don't talk about it on a regular basis. If people were to talk about it more and get more comfortable with it, you'd have more people like, oh, I really should be signed up. This doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, I always thought about organ donation as proof of life after death. Yeah, exactly. When you got the call Mm. that there was a donor face that you could feel good about. What did that feel like when you got that call? I, I just had to make sure. You you sure that this we yes, Robbie, we got a we got a, a donor. Can you be here tomorrow morning? Well, yeah, I can be there. So I I uh, put the phone down. I, I think I know. I just rejoiced. I called Ricky. And I think I might have called my daughter, too. Yeah, she also wasn't an advocate for the surgery. So I was going to say, just to fill in the pieces, because he was so elated with joy, and so was I. But a part of the plan was, and we had been planning, obviously, for years for this call, was that he would call me, and he left out a really vital, important piece of it, which is he lives in Los Angeles. He had to get to Boston in under 24 hours and I live in New York. So he got the call, he then called me. So I'm at midnight, it's about 9.27 a.m. my time. And my wife is already asleep and it's kind of like, oh my God. And I get the call and I'm like, okay, I've rehearsed it. We've talked about it. We've met numerous times. And it's like, okay, what do I do? I'm supposed to call the press, call you know, our videographer, You know, everything's supposed to be ready. We had somebody in place to take Chelsea to the airport. They were out of the country. So anything that could go wrong went wrong, but it all worked out. He got to the airport. He got to Boston. I got to Boston to meet him, got him to the hospital. I think we arrived around 5 p.m., something like that on Friday. 
So you think about he got a call 9 p.m. West Coast time. By 5 p.m. East Coast time, he was rolling into surgery prep. Because there's so many risks to the surgery and you were to some degree at peace without it. Why did you agree when everything was falling into place? What did you want out of this? I, I tried not to, to say what I need because God provides, you know, your daily bread. How can I say what I need? Well, I should have, I deserve, I mean, I don't ever want to even try to use terms like that. There are personal desires. I would love to have lips. I didn't have any lips. So that's a personal desire of mine. There's certain things. That's why I decided to have the face transplant. But under the, cert, under the current conditions, I, would, I mean, you got to live through it. You know, and that kind of joy that God saw fit to provide, huh, how could I ask? I mean, what nerve for me to ask for more? And yet, as it's presented, it seems like morning by morning, new mercies, glory, new mercies unfold. And so I take advantage of what has been presented. This happened to be a face that was rather light. And uh, fortunately, I had a choice in the matter. I, I, I wasn't sure that I could be content with a face that was you know, not even close to my complexion. One of the reasons why he did it was because to eat and drink, he had to literally throw his head back to keep liquids and food in his mouth. And then one of my favorites that he always says is he wanted the ability to be able to express his love for his daughter. By that, I mean, give her a kiss. And so when you put it in perspective like that, it is not really a desire um, for something that's frivolous. It's a desire to function and live and survive. And that's what, what this was really about. It was an opportunity to not only gain those simple things in life, but it was also an opportunity to trailblaze for others, um, to step up and do something that had never been done. Be the oldest person in the world. Be the first African-American to receive a full face transplant. As... The dust was settling after that surgery and you would see yourself in the mirror. Who would you see? What did that feel like? Well, I'll, even the first three months that I was in Boston after surgery, I, I saw another person's face. Today I still see another person's face. That's, you know, we can use the term face, F-A-C-E, but we're really looking at another nose, another forehead, another crown, different cheeks, different lips, mustache, chin, my neck. It's all new. When I have a school to put in my mouth, I have to still figure out where exactly where, you know. My, my middle is not what, in my mind, where, where my middle is of my mouth is not the same as where this mouth really is. So I'm looking at all of that when I look at the mirror. I'm not looking at, oh, well, what do you think about the face? No, <laughs> I'm feeling it. Right now, you see me touching my head sometimes. Hold it. It's because uh, the nerve endings are just, you know. So it's, you know, I, I'm feeling all of this that's, that, that has come from the, the face transplant. I didn't have any of that, obviously, before, not even after the burns. I didn't have the zingers and all of that. Sharp pain, quick, sharp pain, so it gets your attention immediately. It could be in your eyebrows, it could be in my eyelid, because I had to adjust my, a lot of sharp pains. It, it, it gets your attention right away. <laughs> 
But since the face transplant, a new person's face, now I'm going through every hour of my day the connection between myself and this face. What differences did you see in the way people treated you from before the face transplant and after, when you're out and about? I don't pay that much attention to how they treat me. Uh, They have pretty much all through have treated me real good. I I mean, I I see some negative reactions, but it's hard to take that personal. I mean, I'm sure I have expressed negative reactions to certain people uh, because of their condition. Or awkward, not necessarily negative, awkward. Yeah, and you know, even if they do insult you, which, which, which has happened, I know too many scriptures that say overcome evil with good. Jesus himself said to give them Father, they don't know what they're doing. You know, so it's just it's impossible to be angry with the guy that hit me in the accident. How could I be mad with him? It was an accident. I'm sure you almost hit somebody in your car or almost got hit with it's an accident. You know, these things I'm not that concerned about how they look upon you or... He's not concerned because it's a part of his makeup. He's patient, he's sensitive, but I can tell you for just family members and people who are close to us, we've experienced people being awkward. Just, you'd be amazed. My mother um, is a perfect example of one of the people who's probably the most awkward, even though she's just awkward in general. But Post-accident, she had a really hard time uh, seeing and interacting with my godfather. And I think even now, she's still just slowly warming up. She at least makes phone calls. At one point, she was even afraid to make the phone calls. So I was going to say, I think you've learned, but I don't think he's learned. I think he was always sensitive and patient with awkward people. And so he just hasn't adjusted. He just continues to be the same person. After the break. I've experienced much more joy. In spite of the story of Robert Chelsea, it's got nothing to do with the joy that Robert Chelsea has. I'm Kyone Wolf. This is Audacious. Be right back. This is Audacious. I'm Kyone Wolf. Today, you're getting to know Robert Chelsea. At 68 years old, he became the oldest person in the whole world to get a full face transplant. And he was also the first African-American to do it, too. The 16-hour surgery happened six years after a drunk driver smashed into him while he was sitting in his broken-down car waiting for roadside assistance on the shoulder of a Los Angeles highway. The explosion of the impact left him with third-degree burns on 60% of his body, including his face. The man whose face he now wears is named Adrian. According to his brother James, Adrian was a talented athlete. He was a Hendrix-loving guitarist. He was one of those people who would give the shirt off his back for anybody. When Adrian died suddenly and his family agreed to donate his face, they didn't know it would be the first African-American face to be successfully transplanted. And the skin tone was a perfect match for Robert. My producer, Jessica, was with me for this interview, and so was Everick Brown, Robert's godson. He's also the spokesperson for their nonprofit, Donors Dream. I asked Robert how he feels about the dichotomy of being given this gift, right, this new face, but only because somebody died. What does he do with those feelings, with that joy and that solemnity? I see it as a gift. I see it as not just this individual, but the gift was given by God through his family. His family had to make a major decision. They they, they were confronted with this. In moments or a short period of time, they had to make a decision, a final decision on donating their uh, 
uh, loved ones face. So I see this as God touching their heart. And they opened up to the point where they allowed, they gave this gift to me. So sometimes it's hard to take gifts, but I'm getting more used to where these gifts are coming from. You know, how many courtesy gifts have you given people? And you just act simply as a courtesy, as a token. See? But then when you really know that somebody has sacrificed or did all they could do to make sure you have, now that's a real gift, isn't it? I often think, you know, when people ask my godfather that question of how did he change or, you know, how does he feel? He was already every bit of what he is now. And so is there the possibility he was granted this experience because of who he was, as opposed to this experience inspiring him to do all these great things? He was already doing a lot of these things. And and is who he was. He just has not changed that much to me, to be honest. And as it relates to inspiring people of color to donate, it's a really interesting conversation that we've learned as we've, as I've become passionate, he was already passionate, um, is that people of color give at the rate that we represent to the population. Um, what's really unknown is that there is a need because of disease and different things that are, in, the need is in excess of about 35%. So Blacks represent about 12, 13% of the population, but the need is at about north of 35. And so that's vital information that a lot of people don't know, but the sort of caveat is that also people don't understand why people of color are not giving in bigger numbers, which is, you know, having faced adversity um, within this country, there are many reasons why people of color don't just sign up as donors and they're legitimate and they fall from, you know, superstition, religion to scientific reasons that we have experienced as a people in the past. And so when you start to add that all up, you understand, you know, the need um, in the community. But my godfather's perspective has always been global. And so this is a piece of, you know, one of those places where we think it's important to bring attention around donorship. It's every bit of what he said, but I just kind of wanted to fill in some of those gaps. Do you think that the power of and significance of that gift in some ways gives you more motivation to make the most out of this, right? Like you were given this extraordinary gift under these really intense circumstances. Do you think that makes you want to like do great work in a way that maybe you wouldn't have felt about your life if you hadn't received this gift? It is a component of my motivation but most certainly not the incentive. And I'll tell you why, because look what God did before the transplant. Who's making sure that all this is done? One step after the other. I, I had no pain during the, the fire. I was in a coma for six months. Who took care of that? I was in the hospital a year and a half. Who took care of that? <laughs> the fact that I was introduced to Face transplant team. How did that happen? How did you know, the first, the oldest? I, I, they they would only take people at the most fifty years old, and I was already 60, 60, 60 whatever. Well, who took care of that? So this transplant is another reason for me to rejoice and be grateful. What God has exposed me to out of the uh, disabled diaspora, those that go through all kinds of transplantations, all kinds of burn survivor situations. 
with all the awareness that you're bringing and all the interviews you've done and the documentaries and the attention on this, how much of this is a part of your identity now? Like you're the man with the face, you're the, you're the first African-American man with a face transplant. You're the oldest first, 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 like all these amazing singular things. On the one hand, you're still the same guy, but on the other hand, you are also more than you were before in that sense. So how much of this is your identity and how much of it is just part of it? Yeah, you know, I still go to bed in the same bed and I still use the same, you know, I can only wear one pair of pants at a time unless it's cold and I'm so cold. <laughs> Wait, what's cold in LA? <laughs> <laughs> What we think summer is like sixty-eight degrees. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it's it's. You might think that it has that kind of impact that you uh, expressed, but it really doesn't. Same guy, bigger voice. Is what came to mind for me. Um. So as I said to you, he's still the same guy, but. You know, the the format, the forum, um, the audience um, has gotten bigger. And so everybody thinks he's been influenced by the experience. But I wonder if he's influencing or a part of something that is influencing all of these things as opposed to the reverse. And, you know, we just don't have an ability to think about it that way. But having witness from start to where we are now, I, I think that. Same person, bigger voice. Uh, when he woke up out of his coma, his first question was, how are you? How are these people doing? Not what am I doing here? What's happened to me? That's the person. You have a strong faith in God and a relationship with God. I know that the meaning of all this is something that maybe you're not pursuing, you know, trying to trying to understand why would God let the crash happen, but why would God also give you these opportunities and these pushes and pulls and these challenges that you've you've dealt with and grappled with and rejoiced in and struggled with and continue to navigate your way through. When you do listen to God, what do you hear? Were you raised with your, either one of you raised with your mother and father for at least a portion of your life? Yes. How about you, Jessica? Uh, yes, I was. I am. When your father gave you instructions, how did you respond to them? You don't have to answer. What I'm saying is, your heavenly father, who created you, is far more tangible than our natural parents who we feel in touch. You get an education, well, is it tangible? Is wisdom tangible? Is understanding tangible? So, they are as real as your parents. Your heavenly father is just that real. How often do you have access to your natural parents and listen to them? Well, how much more can God speak to you if you are open to listen? So it's not like, oh, well, this is just a rare occasion. Oh, something happened to <laughs> If he wasn't real, we wouldn't be here today. If he wasn't the creative force that put us where we are, why would he not have allow us to have access to interact with him? And our natural fathers are glad to hear from us. You know, and does your dad answer quickly all the time? No. Does he give consideration to what you need and what, what you're asking or what you're uh, facing? Of course he has to, because he's going to give you the very best that he's got whenever he responds. The same way God will take his time with responding to you. And because he's got resources far beyond that. And as a result, he uses those. And sometimes I, you know, ask 
I didn't ask for the accident, but I, but I did, uh, uh, you know, how often do we take, help me to be stronger, help me to understand more, give me more wisdom, give me more, well, you know, then it takes you way over here to uh, the valley, instead of to the mountaintop, takes you to the valley and says, okay, let, let me show you what's down here. You want more wisdom? I'll give it to you, because it's going to be down here. So he opened my eyes to all of this. And I received more joy than I was experiencing before the accident. I appreciate the lilies that's in the valley now. Have you ever uh, been on the ocean and, and you see all these beautiful fish and plants and, and, uh, and different uh, uh, sea life? And we know that there's a greater sea life, or at least equal sea life, that man has not even been able to see because it's so so deep. But it's, I'm sure it's just as beautiful, if not more. I got a chance to see that. I might have been living on the surface at one time, but now that I'm in the valley, I see all the beautiful things that God has opened up to me. I got no questions. I have no energy, new effort, new desire, new uh, life. Do I desire to have to go back to eight years? No. For what? I know what was there. Do you want to go back to 18 or 19? No, sir. As much opportunity, as much as you think that you'd be able to do if you knew what you knew now, you still wouldn't want to go back. Well, I don't either. This life is wonderful. And I want to uh, find more of my diaspora, this disabled diaspora, to encourage them. I've, I've experienced so much now, much more joy. <laughs> the lights are so much brighter. In spite of all of this place and, you know, the burns and the, the story of Robert Chelsea, it's got nothing to do with the joy that Robert Chelsea has. Well, I've asked everything I planned on asking. Is there anything that I missed at all that you want to make sure you say? I think there are a couple of things that um, I'd like to add on his behalf, and I think that's why I'm the sidekick um, here, and I try to be quiet also, Jessica, but as you can see, it's hard for me. <laughs> I try really hard. But one of the things is Donor's Dream, which is my godfather's conception and uh, donors dream in his own word is an organization not for profit that we put together to help those who help others our goal is to raise awareness around the world about organ donation encourage others to donate particularly people of color and to inspire all to be resilient in spite of their atrocities that's really important because as you think about his experience, I think it sort of sums up who he is because this is what he's working on in the midst of trying to recover. Everick Brown, Robert Chelsea, thank you so much for telling me your story and for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have a link to Robert's nonprofit, Donors Dream at ctpublic.org slash audacious. You can also learn more about MOTAP, the National Minority Organ Tissue Transplant Education Program we heard about earlier in the show. And if you're thinking, I'd like to make sure I'm an organ and tissue donor, then I've got a very simple website for you. Organdonor.gov. We'll also have a link to it on our website. Audacious is produced by me, Jessica Severin D. Martinez, and Katie Talarski at Connecticut Public Radio in Hartford. Subscribe to Audacious, and you'll always get to hear the show a day early. Plus, you can listen back to shows featuring things like the awesomeness and agony of not being able to feel any physical pain. And what a 911 operator who hears from people on the worst days of their lives feels when she talks with God. You can hear them all at ctpublic.org slash audacious or wherever you get your podcasts. And thanks for leaving that review on the show. That really helps people find us. Send me your reactions and show ideas on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Kyone Wolf. And my email is cwolf at ctpublic.org. And online, use the hashtag audaciouspublic. 
Thanks for listening. <laughs>